for me, in terms of the loss of pet, the one pets, the one that springs to mind was the, the death of Scruff family, and most definitely not a toy or a problem. How do these uh, metaphors translate to the archers? Well, as you've seen with Justin, do it when you're very young. <laughs> <laughs> firm handover policy. So, well, I don't want to read the audience, but I think that ship has sailed for a lot of us. <laughs> <laughs> There, there are not enough pets or not enough variety of pets and so for the script writers please bring back Mrs Antrobus to bring more dogs yes. in yes. and where are all the fish although in the last few weeks I think we can't know the answer I actually have nothing to do with that and finally a recommendation that we hope might help cheer Shula up because God knows we need to cheer Shula up <laughs> Um, in the course of our research, we found a community that actually enjoyed dressing up their horses. It's called Quadrail. Has anyone ever heard of it? Yeah, it yeah. was new to me. You have. Wonderful. Here's just an example of what they do. <laughs> and on that note, we'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Um, James is around. Just ask a question for James too. Oh, question lady over here. Two questions over there. Um, hi, I've got a question for James. So I'll try and string it out as he's walking up. <laughs> the your scenario in 2026. And I'm just wondering how IT and technology might affect this scenario because that's eight years' time. We've ma experienced massive changes in the last eight years and longer in technology. And Nolly's been there busy showing Peggy how to use a whole load of technology. So I'm just wondering whether it could affect the communications networks and so on. Yeah, I, I mean, we've heard about the issues that Ambridge has with, uh, with broadband, so <laughs> I don't think that'll be resolved by 2026. But I think, uh, I mean, obviously, social media is playing increasingly important factor in, uh, uh, in, in, certain, in the rise of certain cities across the world. Uh, Taliban, for example, have a very effective uh, Twitter presence and very effective at getting their message out quite quickly on social media. But it's uh, uh, they're also very active in uh, dismantling and disrupting uh, government attempts to establish uh, sort of information communication networks in local areas. They, they tend to target uh, mobile phone, phone towers quite a lot uh, in order to get their message, prioritise their message. So, yeah, I think it's a fair point. I think uh, social media will probably play a very important part. I wonder if we could use animals for that, though. Have ferrets or birds carrying a message. Of course, it's very slow. <laughs> Is that the question here? Yeah, um, my question. This one's also for James. I'm really curious at why you didn't include Freddie as a gorilla. <laughs> I kind of feel that he would be a prime candidate. He is disaffected with his mother. He's desperately rebelling against her. Um, and I think actually of all the young men in Ambridge, maybe he would be a top of the list to recruit as a gorilla warfare. <laughs> That's a fair point. And I, I think it's a fair point as well that obviously this is 10 years in the future. So someone like Freddie would actually be more likely to fit the profile than someone like Ed Grundy, who I guess would be in his late 40s or uh, middle, middle 40s. So yeah, that's a fair point, but it tends to be, uh, as I said, the profile tends to be uh, sort of marginally employed, and I guess Freddie, by that time, he would, so uh, I mean, he's gonna, he's gonna, he's either gonna be working at, uh, at Lower Loxley, or he's gonna, get, or his mum's gonna help him out to set him up somehow in internships, so I think uh, there's a good chance that Freddie might not match up. I can't wait for Lily to take it over and give Freddie a tiny little stipend every month. <laughs> <coughs> Other questions? Yes? Yeah, I'm sorry, it's just for James as well. <laughs> uh, unstable, dis disrupted environments and insurgents often leads to profiteers. And I'm wondering if you've considered Josh in that role. <laughs> You are, and then there's a lady behind you. Okay, can I just um, ask about the pets? I sort of, I sort of wonder what the role was in Scruff disappearing and then reappearing, and some sort of 
and, and I sort of wondered, did he come back just to actually die in a morbid <laughs> way, almost? And I just, I just thought it was really, um, really interesting that whole disappearance and reappearance because people were always having the whole hashtag scruff lives, but the fact that it actually happened was well, really interesting. Yeah, that's Actually, I, I was quite keen to examine the whole Scruff Goes Missing versus when Ruby got out and ran around the streets because I know when I lost my dog on the golf course, I was distraught. Mm -hmm. And I didn't get that from Lillian, but from Linda, there was much more of an issue. I thought it was much more realistic. And also, probably underpinned that view that Ruby maybe was a bit of a, a toy, but yeah, mm -hmm. there's obviously some dramatic liberties going on yeah. there to get that thing in. But I think they dealt with it beautifully. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a lady just behind me, and that's the last question time we've got for yeah. It's a question for, um, for Annie and for, or a comment for Annie and Rachel. You mentioned Henry, and Henry's not been badgering anyone for a pet. Um, a hamster comes to mind, and they only have quite short lives, a lot of learning to be done about bereavement and loss. And please don't get Rachel onto a dead hamster story. <laughs> <laughs> it is quite graphic. There's <laughs> <laughs> a fair point. We have had a hamster, of course. Christopher had a hamster at one point. <laughs> Showing off my knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> I think Henry, I wouldn't give a pet to Henry. It's <laughs> <laughs> so dangerous having known his upbringing. Uh, we're going to have to move on to the next section. <laughs> and unsaid. Uh, we've got yeah. oh. I'm not even going to begin to try and pronounce uh, the first title. Congratulations for the people who've got Foucault directly into the conference for the first time. And then the last uh, paper on accent and identity is going to be fantastic. So, I go straight in for the most pretentious title. Yeah. <laughs> um, my, my very short paper is really just an attempt to give you a little micro illustration of some of the work that the BBC pronunciation unit for which I was privileged to work for eight years um, contribute to the arches. So content warning for the anarchists, I will be mentioning the cast slightly. Mm. <laughs> anybody who's making programmes for the BBC, so independent production companies as well as in-house um, programmes like the Archers, on the pronunciation of any word, name or phrase in any language at all. As the unit's resident Archers fan, probably only Archers fan, but certainly <laughs> the biggest Archers fan among the unit staff, it really fell to me to provide advice to the programme's production team on any pronunciations required. The queries range from veterinary terms, um, agricultural terms. I remember being asked about Abermason, the cow's stomach, um, and you know, how would, not how is it pronounced, but how would David pronounce it? Um, <laughs> to Central European names, foods in relation to home farm cookers, who can forget the banyuxa? Um, but doing Jim Lloyd's Latin was always my absolute favourite. <laughs> so I'm going to talk about Jim for a minute, and I'm going to talk about Latin for a minute, and then I'll show you a real example of just one bit of script and a query that we dealt with. So, I think we can all agree that the use of Latin tags and quotations is one of the key character notes for Jim. Even the BBC's own page chooses to use a Latin tag as an illustration of what Jim typically comes out with. And who can forget the ambush phase of 2009 at which Jim dressed in a toga and performed Marcus Corpus Carto's treatise on the medicinal uses of cabbage. <laughs> Go back and listen again if you missed it before. <laughs> okay, so Jim speaks Latin. Um, but how does he speak Latin? How does he pronounce his Latin? Because there's more than one way to do that. Um, so since Latin can be pronounced in a variety of ways, uh, John Rowe, who plays Jim, <coughs> and the script <laughs> production team needed some guidance on how Jim might do it. And this needed to be consistent. You can't have him doing school by Latin one week and constructed another. <coughs> so there were three broad pronunciation models for Latin, um, with small divisions in between them. Reconstructed classical Latin is the pronunciation now taught to students of Latin. It's as close as we can get to how the Romans actually spoke. <coughs> Ecclesiastical Latin, um, as used by the Catholic Church, 
is greatly influenced by Italian pronunciation, and it's the pronunciation, if any of you sing in a choir, if any of you sing in Latin, in um, an ecclesiastical or choral context, <coughs> that's the Latin pronunciation we'd be using. There are small variations within that, according to the country of origin, um, but so when the pronunciation it was advising in year three on titles of cantatas and stuff, but that would be the model to go for. And then there's Anglicised Latin, which, although it would not hasn't been taught to school children for a generation or more, is still referred to as schoolboy Latin. Um, and these are the traditional pronunciations, highly Anglicised, used for Latin words which have been assimilated into English. Typically, this is used for um, Latin words and phrases which relate to medicine or botany or legal Latin, which is highly Anglicised, just like uh, legal French is. But shifting between these models or hybridisation between them is, is common, commonly done. I'm gonna, this is really quick. This is just, I thought I'd give you what, I should, what, I should, what is different from these models. So as far as the continents go, Latin always has hard cut, hard gut, hard tut, whatever comes after it. S is always S, <coughs> J is always Y, so um, Julius, Kaiser, and so forth, um, and H is pronounced. Ecclesial, ecclesiastical and Anglicised Latin do the same thing uh, where the continents soften before the front vowels, um, i.e., a-e, a-e, um, and then the same similar things happen to the ecclesia. So you get ch, like chaley, which in classical Latin means tiny, um, and so forth. So words like ascendit, sushipe, they become sh, and the where they would still be sk in classical Latin. <coughs> Um, and anglicised Latin does the same thing with the vowel softening, does some slightly different things with, with, um, with C and TI, and pronounces its J's as, as J. Uh, okay. And the vowels, um, reconstructed classical Latin and ecclesiastical Latin use the same things, uh, use the same system as each other. Uh, so they have these fairly pure monophthongal vowel qualities. They can be long or they can be short. Um, R, E, R, E, R, E, O, and O. Um, sometimes spelt with a V, of course, in, in, um, in Latin orthography. Um, whereas Anglicised Latin, when the vowels are long, they do uh, sort of A, E, I, O, and U, so you get pater, not pater. Uh, there's also some vowel reduction you can see in, par, par, in pater, which is actually present in pater. Um, diphthongs in proper Latin, reconstructed classical Latin, they are for some of their parts, so you just do the first bit and the second bit, um, as you would if they were short vowels, whereas Anglicised Latin has this or, u, and e for the <coughs> a and o's, as in fetus. <coughs> so, that is, um, oh, and one more thing is for all three systems, you need to know the vowel length because it affects the placement of the stress. Stress in Latin falls on the penult, the second last syllable, if that syllable is heavy, both by consonants, which got a long vowel in it. But on the antipenalt, if not. This is important. <laughs> um, <laughs> as you see in the examples coming up, Latin phrases arrive arrive with the pronunciation without the length marks. As, as indeed my title did not have the length marks in place. Typically, they're not there. So the first thing you have to do is look them up in the dictionary. This and here we have a real live script example. This was a something Jim had to come out with. Um, so first we look up. Check our, check our length marks. We see that Quivis has a long I. Um, Dolore, um, Remedium et Est. Patientia, Patientia. Different choices to make here. So a few years back, Jim said this. So we check the length mark and we think about the model. And although I no longer work at the pronunciation unit, one of my last acts before I left was to write them some notes on, this is how Jim is going to do his Latin now and forevermore. <laughs> and my, my professional decision, up a power. <laughs> My professional decision, after weighing up Jim's age, which might have steered us towards something more schoolboy, against his professed atheism and obvious love of pedantry, was that Jim would be one for doing something as close to what the Romans did as possible. Mm. And therefore, <laughs> in this case, so, uh, so quivis dolori remedium est patientia versus quivis dolori remedium est patientia. I I hope you'll agree with me that um, <laughs> in this case, if all of us like it, you must have to embrace a reconstructed classical Latin as if it's a stickler like Jim. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, so I'm Dr. Rebecca Wood, and I'm an honorary research fellow at the University of Birmingham. And normally I conduct research into autism um, and autism education. And within that, I'm very interested on in language and communication, and in particular, uh, the role and value of silence. And I'm also a devoted listener to the Arches I listen every day. Um, and some of you might know me already from the tweet along, where I tweet as Arches Oatcake, although my main account, my sort of grown up one, um, is the Woodbug. Um, so, for these combined reasons, I'm very interested in the role, the role of the silent characters in the Arches and the ways in which some aspects of philosophy can maybe help us make sense of the part they play in the drama. Now, um, at the conference last year at the University of Lincoln, um, Catherine Ronsett Cole and I talked about the role of disability and disabled characters in the Arches with particular reference to Rob. Um, and we discussed the lack of uh, importance of disabled characters in the drama, and you can read our chapter in this uh, wonderful book. Um, and the issue of silent characters is not dissimilar to this, or at least that's um, how it might seem. However, we're going to start by uh, thinking about non-verbal <coughs> communication in the Archers. Um, and you'll be aware that the, maybe the most celebrated example of this is Linda's sniff. <laughs> <laughs> so this is employed on a regular basis, usually to indicate that she's indignant in some way. And when she sniffs, it's a sort of non-verbal code that lets us know what she, what she thinks. In fact, I don't know about you, but um, I, I find I'm, I've come to sort of listen out for and expect the sniff. <laughs> um, so we're going to hear an example of this now. Um, here she's talking to Jim. Um, about the fact that he's favouring Emma in the parish council elections. So do I? Yeah, if you press on to it. As an ordinary member of the public who happens to support Robert, I can make comments about either candidate. However, as parish council clerk, you are not afforded the same freedom. I was merely levelling the playing field for the benefit of a local voter. Well, it appears your local voters see that help. The point remains, you cannot accuse me of bias. I'm merely reiterating what I've heard from residents in the village. And in so doing, you have been a walking, talking promoter. Oh, I have no personal preference, only an interest in the process. Nonsense. It's been clear since day one, Jim Lloyd, that the only reason you are so shamelessly pro grumpy is because you're so vociferously anti smell <laughs> Um, Linda Sniff is far more expressive than words and has actually superseded this form of communication. However, my favourite examples of non-verbal communication tend to come from Brian, and they involve either newspaper rustling or harumphing. And I find that the newspaper rustling might occur when some of the female characters in particular are talking about something he doesn't really want to be involved in, and it implies that he's sort of cutting himself off from behind the newspaper, he's dealing with more important things than Justin's latest <coughs> tip with Lillian, for example. So we have another example here um, of newspaper action from Brian. And Justin's not going to notice. Of course he'll notice. That's the kind of man he is. Look, I got the distinct impression yesterday that he can't wait for you two to get back together. Well, that's certainly not the impression he's given me. Well, maybe he likes to play games. What do you mean, games? What exactly did he say to you? Well, I can't remember his precise words, but he implied what well, you know what he's like. What? Well, a bit of a dark horse. In what way? He's a businessman. He's a deal maker. Sometimes he, he, you know, he likes to keep his cards close to his chest. Ryan, his relationship with me is not a business transaction. No, no. Makes me sound like a tart. <laughs> so. I should hope not. But he can be a bit of a tease sometimes, can't he? A tease? Don't you think? Well, you think he's been teasing me? Well, I don't know, Lillian. All I was trying to say was, in my opinion, he's keen for the two of you to get back together. <laughs> in the taxi? No, driving it. Oh. Can it be Justin? Uh, oh, yes. Why? I was ready to throttle her. 
Um, as well as these various forms of non-verbal communication, the archers also employ silence and silent characters to a very large extent in the drama, which when you think about it is very surprising, given that this is radio and reliant upon speakers speaking and listeners listening or sniffling or humping. Um, and by silent character, I mean a person who is named at least once but never speaks any lines in the drama. So first of all, how many silent characters are there in The Archers? One. Um, now, when I was first thinking about this presentation last July, um, there were 15 silent characters <coughs> listed on The Archers' website. Um, so it, these are what they were then. Um, and that was 12.5% of all of the characters listed, which again is a lot. Um, and you can see that there were nine male and six female characters at that point, one of whom was Lola Tando, who, as you will know, has since acquired a speaking part. Um, however, as fans of the arts, you'll know that this list is by no means comprehensive. It doesn't include, for example, Bob Pullen or Molly and Tilly Bottom, amongst many others. <laughs> in fact, I find um, it's quite difficult to keep track of how many silent characters there are in the arts, because new ones pop up all the time. So you had uh, Joey the sous chef. Graham replacement vet, Roberta the sax stable hand, and recently we had Archie the silent boyfriend of Pip, and Evan Drexler the friend of Justin Elliott with the outer quarter of Labradors, and we mustn't forget of course, Eddie's mate, Terry Twofolds. <laughs> <laughs> However, I did carry out some random sampling on this, um, and by random I mean on the days when I remember to do it. <laughs> and, um, I came up with the following figures on the appearance of some characters in the arts in 10 episodes between October and December 2017. <coughs> now on each of those days there was at least one silent character referenced in the arches and the highest number was four and this happened in two episodes. And the total number of silent characters across those uh, 10 episodes is 22 which is obviously an average of just over two per episode. And in terms of the male to female ratio um, and here the male characters are orange and the female characters are yellow there were 16 male characters, but only six female. Um, now, I know from the conference last year, as well as my participation in the Archers Tweet Along, that fans of the Archers are extremely knowledgeable about very obscure details. <laughs> so I wonder if anyone can tell me who these uh, people are. First of all, does anyone know who Paul Blockerock is? Black Paul. Oh, Black Paul. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this is information. <laughs> information on the artist's website, um, he's a building contractor, he likes disco dancing, stripping off to Agadu, and he once recommended a lone shark to Eddie. Okay, we'll try another one, perhaps slightly more obscure. What about Rosie Mabbott? Brilliant. Um, as I've said, uh, she's Carrie's sister, she's married to Dennis, and they moved to Northampton, and then to Great Yarmouth, apparently. So, what significance can we attribute to this plethora of silent characters? Well, the obvious point is they help to flesh out the plot, the people you can bring in and then mothball when they're no longer needed, and they tend to be two-dimensional characters who support the development of those speaking parts. So, on the surface of things, silent characters seem to be very unimportant in their own right. They are of low status and they are dispensable. However, um, let us now turn to the famous French uh, philosopher Foucault, or as Linda would call him, Paul Michel Foucault. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, if we consider language from a Foucauldian perspective, then it cannot be separated from ideas about power and power relationships. And certain forms of language use and the discourses and the truths that they create might be centred within institutions of authority. So in the Archers, these might be Damara Capital, Borchester Land, Barrow Farm, or even the village shop and the parish council. Or instead, these power discourses might emanate from certain individuals who wield their authority and influence, particularly through the language they use. So again, we might think of Justin, or Brian, Latif, <coughs> or the Latin-speaking Jim, as we've just heard, or notoriously, Rob. In fact, for the Belgian philosopher and feminist Ariga Hay, these predominantly masculine governing discourses can be described as phallogocentric, mm -hmm. where logos, the word, is used to oppress or marginalise others, and women in particular. 
And similarly, according to the Yazidu, these forms of language use produce and sustain relations of power. And in the Arches, we see this through business meetings, the shoot, the ways contracts are agreed. Or, in the case of Susan, who definitely bucks this phallic-centric trend, especially she's wearing her sign of authority, the tabard, <laughs> in gossip. Therefore, again, it would seem that according to these ideas, silent characters are especially disempowered, picked up and dropped at will, entirely unimportant. Five minutes. Okay. Well, um, okay, so the idea, however, to get to the main point, uh, the ideas of Foucault have also been shown to support the idea that silence and non-speaking can be more powerful than verbal discourses. So Humphrey has explored the notion of the pause from Foucault's perspective, and she thinks that pauses and silences can enable a different truth to be expressed, particularly for people who are marginalised. Um, if you think about the pause earlier that Brian used um, when he uh, confirmed that he didn't think that Lillian was a tart, his silence actually tells us what he really thinks. <laughs> and Aitchison has also challenged the idea of linguistic silences as something missing, a void waiting to be filled by speech. So silence is not empty and valueless, but has its own worth and influence. And for Aitchison, silences can in fact be gestures, a form of communication which is more powerful than speech. And so, according to these ideas, silence is both powerful and empowering, creating a shift in our understanding of the role of silent characters in the arches. In fact, they emerge as crucial components in the drama, more important than some of those are speaking parts. And just in case you're not convinced by this argument, uh, let's consider the example of Frida Cry, who's never spoken a single word in a single episode and is now in fact dead. And Eric <laughs> Allen, who plays her widow, Bert, <coughs> said the following after her demise. She's only silent for the listener. She's never been silent for me. I've always had a strong impression of her as a real person. It's not a visual image, it's emotional, a very strong feeling of her presence. And over the years, we've learned a great deal about uh, Frida. Um, there's also the Frida Fry Rose and poetry written by Bert in her honour. In fact, characters with speaking parts can come and go or appear very rarely in the drama or they get dropped completely. But silent characters like Frida remain thoroughly ensconced in the arches. Um, and perhaps the ultimate accolade was that when she died in the Ambridge Flood, Nancy Banks Smith wrote a column dedicated to her and even compared her to the Queen. Um, and she also wrote once brilliantly that there was a time when Frida attracted the admiration of Nathan Booth, another total side of <laughs> It was a disturbing little idol. You never knew it. Was. <laughs> And also at the uh, Flower and Produce Show, we now have the Free to Find Memorial Award, which was won last year by another silent character, Cecil Jackson. <laughs> um, and if you remember, um, Bert and Joan got the idea that he was terminally ill, and so they decided not to oppose him, um, and then only to learn that he was in tip top health and he won, celebrating by dancing. An extract from that episode now. Oh, they missed the presentation. Cecil? Yeah, he's got the cup. Cecil's daughter, 
uh, showing how silent characters can spawn secondary silent characters <laughs> and their own character networks. Uh, and in fact, the whole of that episode was dominated by silent characters, as others have been. And there were also many key events in the Ambridge calendar that could not take place without the Button Girls, for example, and many other silent characters. One minute. Okay. Um, so, in fact, the presence of silent characters derives from a long-standing literary tradition, and I've got some examples up there on the slide. And these examples prove not only uh, that silent characters impact on the drama in ways you might not be aware of, but that their role is not to be underestimated. And if Foucault showed us the intimate connections between language, meaning and power, his work also suggests that meaning is not only achieved through what is spoken, and that the physical act of speech can be superseded. Not only this, but that the Archers, in featuring so many silent characters, emerges as a radical drama, extending this literary tradition into brave new territories, that of the radio listening medium, the ultimate taboo. What next? Perhaps an episode of the Archers consisting only of silent characters, <laughs> punctuated by the mooing of cows, the bowing of sheep, an occasional sniff, and the gentle sound of the free fry rose blowing in the breeze. <laughs> memory, but wasn't it with Frida's, at Frida's service, it was said of her, she always had an opinion on everything and a great laugh, yeah. <laughs> I thought it was fantastic. Uh, so, uh, last paper for this session, Rob. Yeah. Right, hello. Uh, this is my first uh, academic arches, and I, I thought, I honestly thought I knew what to expect. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, accent. I, I mean, I could speak all day about uh, accents in the Archers. I could speak all day about just the Grundys uh, and accents, <laughs> or just Pip. Uh, to be fair. <laughs> <laughs> and I think, uh, Nobody wants that. I, uh, <laughs> I think some of you might be might be hoping I'm just going to speak about Ruth, but I, um, I'm not. I do have some thoughts on Ruth, and I can, I can share them uh, with you. Anyway. The, so I come from, uh, from the idea of uh, background of sociolinguistics, so just in case anyone doesn't realise, sociolinguistics is this idea that um, uh, it's the interaction of language and society, and uh, within that I come from, I look at language variation and language change, so the way language varies between speakers, uh, between groups of speakers, or just within the individual. And I'm very interested in the way identities are created through, uh, uh, through speech. And uh, I come from the idea that um, the way we speak not only plays a crucial role in the performance of identities, you can go further and say that those identities don't really exist until they're created, until they're enacted within that interaction. But that's what, that's what creates them in the first place. And of course, accent is very uh, important in that. And TV and film often use accent in order to create characters, this whole process of characterization. So it's not a, it's not a new thing. But of course, with, with film and television, you have all of these other resources. You do, you're not just relying on the voice. You've got the way, the way people look. Uh, the way people dress, the way people move, and all of these things. But in radio drama, you don't have that. And so it, it adds that extra focus on accent. Um, up there, that's, uh, that's uh, Mufasa and Scar from, uh, from The Lion King. They're a perf perfect example. If you haven't seen The Lion King, think um, Toby and Rex. They're, they're two brothers. <laughs> kind of a good year. Will and Ed. They're two brothers who are kind of one good, one bad. And, uh, but interestingly, uh, the good one, uh, Mufasa, has a British... Accent, uh, sorry, American accent, and the bad one, Scar, has, has a British accent, uh, because that's it, the way American films work, that's it, the baddie must have a, have a British accent. So it's that idea that having, having an English accent just kind of indexes, it signals that idea of, 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 of villainy and, uh, and evil. Um, and so, and that's what happens in, in the Archers as well, we have these, these different characteristics. So what I thought I'd do, I, I wanted to, to separate that accent element from, from everything else. Of course, it's not just the accent, of course, it's, it's what people are saying and all of these things. So I wanted to, to, in order to separate the accent, the only way I could think of doing it was to ask non-Archers listeners uh, to listen to some, some clips and to, to evaluate those, those voices, those personalities, just on those accents. And that's not, a, that's not a kind of a strange thing to do. We do this a lot in social linguistics. We, we play people uh, uh, voices and we ask them to evaluate them on, on all various kind of characteristics and people are very, very good at this. We're very, we have a very strong uh, attitude system towards accents. We all have our favourite accents and accents we don't particularly like 
and we invest a whole load of meaning in these things. So I asked um, non to listeners to, to, to listen to uh, various and they, have, they were asked to scale them on these particular categories of posh, educated, uh, intelligent, kind, friendly and trustworthy. These together, the posh, edu posh educated, intelligent, uh, are seen as kind of status, uh, ideas of status, and the kind, friendly and trustworthy are seen as a measure of solidarity. Often the two are opposite. Somebody high on, on status will be low on solidarity. And this is true for lots of accents, for example, a sort of RP, received pronunciation accent, is often quite high on status, but low on solidarity, it's not particularly friendly. So I asked these people, and I chose a, as I said, a random selection of voices. I'll be honest, I just, I listened to a lot of, it was trying to find content neutral clips, clips where they're not giving away. You can't have a clip of Brian talking about anything to do with how much land he owns, because it invests, you know, we know that he's going to be a certain kind of status. So I listened to those, obviously took out Shula, because I can't, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Tom, I also have problems with Tom, and this is very bad. As a social linguist, I'm very, I, I spent all day, my whole academic career, is arguing for the, the equality of all accents. There is no, we can have preferences, but we should never judge people. And I, I find it very hard uh, not to judge uh, Tom. The, an example, just an example of one kind of clip I used. Oh no, oh how, right. How do I get this to play? There we go. No? Okay, we're not playing. Okay, it was just a tiny, it was a tiny example of one of the one of the examples. But I, they're all very, very short, eight to ten seconds. Of course, we're all very excited about Emma getting into politics. Oh, she's got all her signatures now. Okay, so there's nice one. So you know, it was it was that kind of clip. So very very short, very rapid. They just listen to them, evaluate them, listen, evaluate, and so on. Okay, so what do we find out? Unsurprisingly, there are certain people who are who are seen as posh again, just from that very very short clip. Um, people like Brian, Jennifer, Jim and Linda. So uh, uh, on that chart you can see sort of anything over to the right is, is very posh, um, anything over to the left is, uh, is less posh. And it's pretty kind of predictable I think. Uh, people who are friendly, uh, we, we kind of, then you seem to get the opposite really. Um, you get people like uh, Ian, Jazza, Emma, Clary being pretty friendly. Bit of a stretch with, with, with Clary, some people think not so friendly. Ruth, Susan seems friendly. Um, yeah, well, I see. Again, you see that's the you see that's why I try to isolate accent because we have so much invested. We know these characters so well, but just hearing them. But what was particularly interesting, I thought, was when you start using uh, non-native English speakers. So the, the people I use them on, my, stu my students, let's be honest, uh, was, <laughs> I, figured, uh, I figured they were they were non archers listeners, and I was I was I was right. <laughs> there was one. There was one awkward-looking mature student uh, in the class, and uh, so I, I think I know where these are from, Rob. Um, <laughs> everyone else was guaranteed kind of naive listeners. But I also had some international students. So the students who the English is fantastic, but they didn't grow up here. They don't have the same cultural associations. And if we look at things like posh, posh and not posh, so posh on the left, the same chart that I showed you before, Brian, Jennifer, Jim and Linda being very posh, over on the right, they didn't have that. These are the, so the, the other chart is the, the second language, English as second language speakers. They don't have the same cultural associations. Look at Clary. Some of them thought Clary was the poshest person. <laughs> because there is nothing intrinsically posh about those voices. We just, this, it's this accent, the RP, received pronunciation accent, and we invest all of this meaning into it. There's nothing about those physical sounds. All of speech are just sounds you know, created from air coming through our lungs, out of our mouth, and uh, when we adjust it, there's nothing that makes that posh. It's all of the cultural associations, and they don't have that. And there was quite a big difference. Uh, you know, I did some proper stats on it, and these ones in pink, there were statistically significant differences between these, these evaluations. Uh, they just don't have the same associations. Um, in terms of, it, an example of this is uh, status and solidarity. Like I say, usually people, if you score high on one status, you're, you're low on solidarity, except, interestingly, Matt. Um, <laughs> Matt, Matt not, not only is he low status, he, he, he was actually seen as fairly friendly. When we did friendly, he was alright, but trustworthy, he just, <laughs> he, just, he just kind of bombed. So, uh, this is a nice example of, of Brian, Brian and Emma. So, uh, again, with the, with the first language speakers, so this is predictable, really. We've got Brian high on status, uh, pretty low on solidarity, and Emma uh, low on status. I don't know if the clip I used for Emma, I mean, she came much higher on friendliness, solid, friendliness, kind, all of these things, higher than I thought she would. 
Uh, but again, the clip I used, I don't know, maybe she did, she sounded particularly friendly. Um, but again, with the second language speakers, there just wasn't this difference. There was just, it was just a, a no significant pattern. There were no, so these, the differences between, the, in the first two, the differences between status and solidarity for Brian are st statistically significant. With the non-native speakers, there just wasn't that at all. Um, and generally, their, their range of scores, they were asked to score them really from 1 to 10, the range of scores was much greater. It could just, it could, could just as easily be, be a 1 as a 10 for, for many of these things. Um, so in terms of what all this means, what's the point of all this, uh, the, uh, it's just really to show that the artist does use these, these quite broad stereotypical uh, accents in order to create characters, and, and quite, quite rightly too. In a sense, they match the status divisions <laughs> I was about to say in real life, and I, 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 I <laughs> exactly. So uh, yeah, in, I don't know. In that alternate reality that we kind of exist in at the moment, we have these very clear class distinctions, and it's a sweeping generaliz generalization. But it is there is a, a, a whole lot of truth behind it that the lower down the social scale, the broader the regional accents, and that, that's just that's just a, a fact of British society. Posh people sound the same wherever they're from. Think of it as a triangle going up. If you have uh, so, social, social status up the side and regional variation across the two it's like, across the bottom it's like a triangle that the higher up you go the less regional variation you get the real regional accents happen in, in kind of the working class so there is this rural RP kind of class distinction or maybe not class but status if you think about people like Brian and then people like the Grundys the rural, I mean, seriously, we could have a week on the rural accents of the Archers. Uh, and I know uh, my uh, a linguistic colleague, Will Barris, uh, talked about this a couple of years ago uh, in this conference, um, talked about a little bit about the Grundy accent, because it doesn't, it doesn't match where we think of uh, Ambridge as being. Uh, Joe possibly gets away with it, but the younger Archers, not a chance. And the difference between Will and Ed is, is kind of uh, is <laughs> unusual. But... <laughs> but what, what, what they're doing, though, I think what they're doing, quite right, they're, they're, they're using what's a stereotypical rural accent. It's, it's just our kind of British rural accent in the same way. Uh, I, was, I was giving a, a, a talk, uh, what was it? No, it was, yeah, I was give, talking about this, actually, on Radio 3. And uh, I was talking about this the other day, yes. this very thing on Radio 3. And, uh, and the, Matthew Sweet, uh, the guy who was uh, running the programme, said, um, why, why do we have a, why do pirates speak in a certain way as well? <laughs> and uh, that threw me, I'll be honest. <laughs> I literally, I, I, yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah, exactly, yeah, obviously, now I know, now I know, but I didn't, I didn't know anything about pirates, but again, it's, it's this idea of just picking on a, on a, on a stereotype and picking on, you know, pirates, and, and there is a historical reason why pirates be like that, you're absolutely right, but in terms of, in the ruralness, it's just picking on these particular pronunciations, particular pronunciations, particular vowels, kind of what we call the lot vowel, that kind of, that it becomes very drawn out, and the palm vowel, long drawn out, and, uh, and that rotted, that, that rotted, it sounds like I say erotic, but it's a, I'm going to say, I'm just saying that Will Grundy has a, an erotic accent. He doesn't have an erotic accent. <laughs> but it is what's known as erotic, a, 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 it has this erotic R, this post vocalic R, pr pronouncing the R in words like R. And these things wouldn't really happen where, where Boris is supposed to be. It, it would happen sort of uh, further, uh, further in the southwest, a little bit in the northwest as well. But anyway. Um, and then in terms of the, what I thought was interesting about the non-native speakers is because they don't have those same associations, it just goes to show how much uh, of our opinions and attitudes towards accent are it's purely a social construct. And if you don't have those social constructs, then that whole meaningful accent dis, uh, distinction disappears. And that's it. <laughs>
our pronunciation has changed just in the last 50 years, the last 100 years. How did you actually decide how the Romans spoke? Okay, well, I didn't personally decide. <laughs> <laughs> um, Classical Latin is um, the, you know, the, the product of, of a lot of scholarship in, in Latin studies. And um, we do kind of know how, actually, within the context of Catholic book in ancient Rome, um, we have evidence from what rhymed with what, we have evidence from, there are actually some grammatical texts, this is outside my real house slightly, but there are some grammatical texts about um, uh, stress place of business, and so we, we do know, um, uh, we know things that were the same, sounds that were the same as the sound, so there are actually contemporary descriptions of pronunciation which give us a pretty good idea of, of what, how the Romans actually spoke, so reading from the classic is based largely on, on that, so yes, I was a uh, Standing on the shoulders of those particular gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> um, question for Rob. Um, I'm interested in the difference in perception of Ian's accent and Ruth's. Um, to me, Ruth is incredibly annoying. <laughs> I, I know this is my own prejudice. She's, she's just from a certain part of the country. Ian is simply Irish. But he is perceived as being of much lower status. I noticed by L1 and L2 speakers. Yeah, I think I think when we get to uh, to regional accents, as in uh, non, so we have all the RP accents, which are kind of regionless in a, in a sense, um, and then we have the rural accents. Then, of course, you've got the, all of these characters, which are relatively new. If you think about the, the characters who've been there forever; tend to be either RP or rural. And then the newer characters, much more regional variation in, uh, has come in. Generally speaking, an accent like Ian's would be see, would score more highly on on solidarity. Uh, it's that it's that kind of accent. It's always seen as quite friendly and quite trustworthy. Um, for the L two speakers, I think I think really it was that it, it doesn't sound uh, it 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 would have been very unfamiliar to them, I think, and it doesn't quite. So my question was more: Why is Ruth Fosher Ian? Oh right. Okay. Well, in terms of what for the L1 speakers, I can't remember. Did she? She, she well, she comes up. I think she. I think she is quite. You see, we have this idea of posh, this RP tinge. I think Ruth has a fairly posh accent for that that region. You know, it's within within every region, with every regional accent. You know, you can have posh Bolton and not posh Bolton. There's still that 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 strength, and I think, and I, I my my thing is on Ruth personally. I think she gets uh, oh, she gets a really hard time. That accent oh, is. Um, <laughs> and, no, no. In terms of the accent, she gets a hard time because the accent is quite quite genuine as a character. Jeez, well, yeah. well, what, 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 <laughs> but with uh, Sugar and Thomas, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. Because I've mostly fallen asleep. Um, <laughs> Last question. Louise Gilly, Susan Lover and very posh Bolton. <laughs> I'm interested in the fact that Susan's found trustworthy because that's what I think too. But given that she's a status lover, why has she never had elocution lessons? Yeah. Oh. Yeah, she's, she's a fun one. She'd be she'd be an interesting character to I would have thought would want to <coughs> would want to in her eyes better herself. And that is that is an unusual thing. I would Say she's, she's a classic example of that. Also, what I didn't mention, funny enough, related, is that people like Linda, Linda as a character, is kind of performing poshness. Yeah. Even, so, yeah. no, you've got, you've got actress, character, but then the character is performing yeah. poshness yeah. as well. And I think, and Jennifer as well. And I think that's an interesting thing. But yeah, you're absolutely right. I don't know why Susan doesn't tend to do that. Sometimes she use, does it in a vocabulary. She, she kind of uses words uh, and, and the grammar in a certain way that, that suggests kind of a higher status, but the actual pronunciation, uh, you know, no, she's 100% staying where she is, and it comes across as very friendly and, uh, and trustworthy. <laughs> you know, more. Right, we're going to have to move on. I know we could, it, that's, it's worth a whole day, isn't it, speaking. We've got days on planning and days on language now. Coming up. We've got three now quick fire papers to take us up to um, lunchtime. We have a returning paper to carry on the stories from last year to begin us with. Um, and then we're looking at climate. Um, and then we're looking at the Morris dancing. <laughs> So, uh, yes, 
good afternoon. Um, I have to say, when I gave my paper last year, apparently it made some people's heads hurt. So I'm hoping I won't have this reaction this time around. Um, and when I did present that paper on the history of the First, of first World War commemoration in Ambridge, um, I mentioned in my talk that I was having some difficulty in locating the Ambridge War Memorial. Um, with the efficiency for which the Academic Archives Research Associates are known for, Laurie McLeod almost immediately tweeted me with a link to English Heritage's, now Historic England's, uh, pamphlet on recording and listing war memorials, uh, which includes in their guide um, the description of the Ambridge War Memorial. <laughs> And this reads as follows. The memorial, as set, uh, set on a grassed area, consists of a Yorkstone obelisk with a total height of 2.3 metres, set on a square base and pedestal. The northern face on the obelisk has a wreath in high relief, and below is the inscription, below reads the inscription, which reads, below is the inscription which reads, erected to the glory of God and in honour of the men of Ambridge, who served their king and country in the Great War 1914 to 1918, in memoriam. Below are the names of the three men who died with their rank, regiment, or ship. Beneath this is the inscription, Lest We Forget. The eastern side lists those who were wounded or taken prisoner, and the western face those who also served. Now, this is a very unusual feature of, war memori of a war memorial. Um, the southern face has the inscription, Also in Grateful Remembrance of All from This Parish Who Served in the Second World War, 1939 to 1945, followed by the names. The memorial is surrounded by chains linking four timber posts. Now, this is the Hookham War Memorial. I couldn't find an image of the Ambridge War Memorial. And <laughs> has already asked me today, have the chains been stolen by metal thieves? Yeah. I think the answer is yes. Horribins! <laughs> <laughs> <Yes. laughs> um, the leaflet goes on to note that the memorial, which was unveiled on 16th of May, 1921, by Sir Robert Pargeter, is located on land on the south side of Main Street, originally donated to the parish by Miss Adeline Smith of the Manor. Now, based on this information and referring to the Archer's Attic's official map of Ambridge, I believe the memorial to be located where you see the red circle. Now, there's a possibility, based on where I believe Main Street could be, that it could be at the other end of the green, up by the pond, but I think that it's more likely to be outside the town hall, uh, the village hall, excuse me, um, and then uh, could have a procession from the memorial to St. Stephen's on, um, on Armistice Day or Remembrance Sunday. Now, as a historian of First World War in memory, the description of the memorial raises a number of interesting questions for me. If Rupert Pargeter is, is one of the three names of the dead listed, I presume, um, whose are the other two of the men of Ambridge? Which regiment, or indeed ship, ship seems slightly odd for this part of the country, did they serve on? And if it was a ship, why were they uh, in the Navy? Who's the names of those who were wounded, taken prisoner, or who also served? As I said, this is very unusual and provides an opportunity for finding out a lot more about war service in Ambridge um, than most memorials do. Um, and what is their memory and the legacy for the village today? So to answer these questions, I would like to make a modest proposal to the entire academic archers community. I would like to invite you to join me in researching and creating a virtual Ambridge War Memorial as part of the wider national network of such community-based research projects which has arisen as part of the centenary of the First World War in this country. This project would involve the following steps. Firstly, interested members of the academic archers community should contact me and I will be around later and I can put my contact details on the Facebook page um, to become part of a virtual war memorial committee. <laughs> With the permission of the academic archers founders, we will form a supplementary Facebook page for community gatherings, discussions and meetings. The community will then apply to the Heritage Lottery Fund. <laughs> I'm, I'm serious, I've actually looked into this. They would, they would welcome the proposal. Um, First World War then announced now scheme for financial support. The funding will pay for a web domain, for the virtual memorial, for expert training in family history research and events, which might include talks from First World War, war historians. I've had interest from uh, Dr. Dan Todman and Professor Jonathan Boff, um, and archivists from the National Archive. Again, I've spoken to some. 
using this training, the, uh, excuse me, uni using this training, the community members will research the relevant surnames in the databases collated by the Lives of the First World War project. There are 2,959 archers, 121 partitories, and 1,186 Grundies listed on this quote, digital memorial. Um, I, that was as far as I got with my very quick research into names, knowing the time limits on this talk. Um, we would draw on the wider community expertise to identify other relevant surnames that would have existed in the village circa 1914 to 1918. I'm a very new member. Um, I've only been listening for about uh, 15 years, so I would rely on more experienced uh, academic archers listeners. Um, and as part of this process, the committee members would be encouraged to add the details that they uncover to the lives of the First World War project in the process that is described as remembering the actual individuals who existed. The committee members would also be invited to use their research to contribute to a digital uh, Ambridge War Memorial. I've created a prototype page here. Um, it's not really live yet, but it could be developed. Um, in addition to speculative biographies of named individuals, contributions could include any form of imaginative engagement with the research material, artwork, films, songs, poetry, other forms of commemoration. Um, if anybody's been following first world, uh, the uh, 1418 Now project funded by the Arts Council, you'll know there's a lot of artistic responses to the memory and commemoration of the First World War across the country. I'd like to make this part of that. There would also potentially be scope for committee members to reflect on the research process and the relationship between creative and commemorative practices they experience, which would be fabulous data for those of us who work on the legacy and memory of the First World War in this country. As well as producing what I hope will be an important complement to the academic outputs already produced by this community, such as custard culverts cakes for sale outside, this project would, I believe, have other collaborative benefits. It would, for example, serve potentially as case studies for colleagues exploring the sociology of digital communi communities, or those such as Jerome Turner, whose essay in Custard Culverts and Cakes examines creativity as community practice on social media. This could be another case study. Ideally, the project would also offer the BBC scope for development of future storylines, fleshing out the uh, history of Am Ambridge's history through the historically-based characters that the memorial will commemorate. <laughs> Above all, the project is intended to provide committee members with new skills, ideas, and creative outlets. I hope you will be inspired to enjoy me in, in this endeavor. Thank you very much. for organising this, this is wonderful. And so we give, and we're going to be talking about the apparent low rates of skin cancer in our <laughs> It's funny. <laughs> As you all know, skin cancer is the most common form of cancer in the UK. It's rising year on year, and only last year, the British Journal of Cancer reports that 23% of melanoma skin cancer occurs in agricultural workers. It's more common in men than women, Skin cancer is visible, it's often multiple, and most people survive. The dermatology team in Borsetshire should see around 200 skin cancer patients per month. <coughs> Ambridge, with its ageing farming community, is ripe for skin cancer. So why don't we see more of it? The cardinal symptoms of many cancer <coughs> are not readily discussed by our stiff upper lip society. Lumps in breasts, lumps in testicles, blood in your womb, blood in your stool. Alterations in appearance will draw comment, and changes in the skin will be remarked upon. Of course, Javon Donovan, with her Celtic fair skin, succumbed to melanoma in 2007, but she's not a born and bred for such a gun. Joe at 96, Berta at 81, have both worked outside all of their lives. 
perhaps they're ignoring the growths on their skins. Or perhaps the lack of a GP presence in Ambridge means they're not going to get I doubt this, though. Clary would soon be bundling Joe off to Falkersham to see Dr. Law. And if all else fails, we could surely rely upon Susan Carter to publicly mark upon any, any um, disfigurement that open that show. So what is it about the inhabitants of Enbridge that they're doing that so reduces their rate of skin cancer? Well, there are a number of forces at play here. Environment, genetics and behaviour. By far the commonest cause of skin cancer is ultraviolet light. Artificial sunbed um, exposure is also an increasing factor. Other causes include chemicals such as coal tar, mineral oils, soot and arsenic. What about trichloroethylene? Oh, TCE? <laughs> yeah. No reported cases as yet. Neil Carter! Right, so we all know that Ambridge has got a strange microclimate. You only need to think about the floods to, to realise that. But... <coughs> The UV exposure in Ambridge is going to be similar to any other rural location in the UK, because how else would the herbal lazy flourish? <laughs> um, other than the outdoor workers, we also need to consider the recreational activities that might put residents at risk. So there's Adam and Ian on the hot tub. Although, I understand that to be more of an evening activity. <laughs> the Ambridge youngsters, do they ever go out? There's a distinct possibility that the bridge farm children don't go out ever since the auto incident and worrying about Rob. Um, Paul Bear. Paul Bear has been out on his bike for months. <laughs> <laughs> we need to worry about him. Somebody needs to. The female aldridges. They have an increased risk of sun cancer, what with a swimming pool, and the financial ability to jet off to, to sunny climes whenever they want to. Lillian, with her years in the Channel Islands, her life on the run with Matt, and now her extravagant travel with, with Justin, or perhaps she's actually had a few skin cancers secretly removed, have during um, what um, Brian calls her monkey gland treatments. <laughs> The next consideration is genetics. The biggest risk is people with pale, freckly skin who burn easy, like Chabon. <laughs> the rates of skin cancer in Asian and black skin is uncommon. Uh, skin cancers can run in families with known genetic um, uh, predisposition. It would be a far stretched theory to suggest that Ambridge settlement was traced back to the farmers of the Ray tribe who came in from the Middle East, conferring some form of genetic skin cancer protection in Ambridge. <laughs> so, so far there appears to be little to explain this anomaly, this low rate of skin cancer in Ambridge. Is it something that they're doing? Well, the final contributing factor is our behaviour. So what we do or do not do in the sun. <laughs> <laughs> important in sun protection. Skin cancers occur on sun-exposed skin. Melanoma skin cancer, 41% in the men on their backs and 38% in the lower legs in women. So it's definitely worth considering what behaviours are at play here. I'm not convinced that the Ambridge residents are vigilant at applying sun cream. Ruth and David barely had time to throw a frozen pizza in the argon. <laughs> so would they ever have had time to apply sun cream to the children? And we haven't heard Joe moaning about Clary nagging him about putting the sun cream on. And not even Elizabeth seemed, seemed to particularly over worry about Lily and Freddie slapping on the sun cream. However, how many times have we heard Susan screech at Ed and Neil, but especially Ed, to remove their overalls before stepping across the threshold at Ambridge View? Perhaps the overalls are the answer. Well, there's Jill in her bee suit. And what about the keen equestrians? Legs over covered up with job prison riding boots? And there's the air-conditioned tractors and natural sun protection. All along, we've been worrying about the lack of sun protection factor in the inhabitants of Ambridge. We've been missing the obvious. Of course. The, the way, way protection, protection factor.
Morrison once wrote that there was only one sound worse than Morris dancing, and that was the arches. I <laughs> 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 not here today. <laughs> now, whilst I'd not say that all arches listeners are fans of Morris dancing by any means, and whilst I wouldn't say that all Morris dancers are fans of the arches, I felt from experience that there was quite a significant overlap. I'm an ex Morris dancer, because my knees don't work anymore, and an occasional Morris musician. I wondered why there was no Morris side in Ambridge itself, given that it's very close to the Cotswolds, it's very close to the Welsh border. So a small research project came about, right share my findings with you today. From 109 <laughs> respondents to my online surveys, 86% listened to the Archers, 63% are involved in Morris dancing. The majority of respondents felt that Ambridge would probably like a Morris side, there'd be room for one there, possibly even two competing sides. There were suggestions for the sides existed in the past, possibly uh, formed by Nigel Pargeter, or that it even still exists in a silent form, which I know a lot of people <laughs> Outside the ball in 1894, this is in um, the old Trigorin uh, book, may or may not have been a past side. For those of you not familiar with the art form, um, Morris takes many forms. There's Cotswold, Border, Molly, Rapper, loads of different sorts, Longsword, and they're all sort of the main ones. Cotswold is a style most people know as Morris. Bells, hankies, and flowered straw hats. But many modern revival sides um, dance border, which traditionally wear brighter coloured or darker clothing and often wear um, masks or paint their faces for disguise. Some sides have a fool who entertains the audience uh, between dancers and may collect money with menaces. <laughs> and some have a beast, which is often a full scale hobby horse worn by a participant. Most of my respondents felt that Ambridge would dance in the Cotswold style, as Edgley do, <laughs> and uh, feeling that, that Jim and Linda Snell, as traditionalists, would insist on that. More research needs to be done into what the Borsuchia tradition consists of, and that might take us back to our first year's enormous research grants. Oh, oh, yes, <laughs> enormous. So what costume would they wear? Again, <laughs> the majority of those surveyed favoured variations on traditional Cotswold costume, but there were some wonderfully creative suggestions. I really liked one suggestion that Freddie might lead an extreme steampunk youth side to annoy everybody. Um, and also the suggestion that they might wear tweed plus fours with matching deer stalkers. <laughs> Many suggestions included the team wearing a shade of green known as Barwick for some reason. <laughs> um, and I'm really glad the bunting's been found because I think bunting has to be in it in some form. <coughs> Ambridge Morris would have a banner and a unique badge. By far the most popular choice for things to be on this uh, included Pint of Shires, the Village Pomp, Bartleby, or the Badger of David Archer <laughs> um, But there were other suggestions like sponsorship by BL or Grey mm -hmm. Gables, or a logo of a bridge and river to suggest the name of the village. And there were several votes for Bridge Farm Sausages. Anyway. <laughs> this is how it's <laughs> That's over there for a moment. There is a pole for it to go on for later. Oh. <laughs> so, who might get involved? <laughs> and in what way? Eddie Grundy and Linda Snell seem to be definite. Linda may not be up to dancing now, as I am not myself. And somebody said she should have been retired, but nobody would be brave enough to tell her. <laughs> um, but she wouldn't be able to keep out of it. So, she'd research historical documents, she'd design the costumes, she'd bicker with Joe about who should be in charge, and would in any case insist on being the squire of the ladies' side. The squire is the leader of the side, not all sides have one. 
Interestingly, most suggestions for squire were men in the village. Um, traditional patriarchy, which I think we touched on last year. Um, but there were also suggestions that Kirsty or Kate, strong female figures, uh, might take up squire, but I don't think Kate would be able to sort of sustain interest for very long in that. The side would need musicians. It was noted that although Eddie and Jolene both sing, there's a real dearth of musical instrument players in Ambridge. Fallon, however, was seen as a closet melodeon player. <laughs> and that's the best place for most of us melodeon players. <laughs> I love the suggestion that Linda would insist on either playing the pipe and tabor um, as the sole musician, or would force Robert to learn the melodeon himself. <laughs> Adam playing banjo and Ian on the fiddle. Um, <laughs> but pipes were the traditional instrument in the past, and you will hear some later. So maybe it would just be jazzer. The fool was seen as the obvious role for Eddie, but Toby, Kenton and Joe Grundy would give him a good run for his money. So I want to move on to the other side of my um, talk. and Lucky me, I can't. Um, this part of my survey stems from my experience of dancing a masked Morris dance to Barwick Green at a wedding. Um, I felt sure that many Morris dancers, being Archer's listeners, at least a few sides would use their love of the Archers in their dancing and would dance to Barwick Green, which is after all a Maypole dance tune. Only ten sides could be identified by name, they're all mapped out there, with um, Bare Bones, who have joined us, are the, the topmost marker, the most northern one. But many res respondents recalled seeing dancers to this tune by unnamed sides, including one performance at Inkbarrow, which is the village in Worcestershire that um, sees itself as the, um, the inspiration for the archers, and this was danced outside the bull itself. Several, indeed a large number of respondents, admitted to dancing to Barwick Green in the privacy of their own home. <laughs> <laughs> the arch of influence on the Morris spreads more widely, however. For example, Stone and Crow's Morris have a dance called Loxley Barrett, not dance to Barwick Green, however, and there are dancers named The Bull and Grundy's Delight, which I'd love to see. <coughs> Finally, I would like to invite you to come out to the lunch area, where Bare Bones and Border Morris will perform a dance to Barwick Green, and then let anyone who would like to have a go. <laughs> <laughs> for any questions that people have got for our speakers from that panel. And then I think we should all go in, get some lunch and get dancing. So are there any questions? women dancing in, in Ambridge. Um, most of the sides said it would definitely be men and women. But part of my survey also said, do you think mixed sides or all women's sides or all men's sides are best? And the biggest answer of all was, who cares as long as everybody's enjoying themselves? And I think... In, you know, <laughs> Any more questions? Olivia has a question, and we have a question up there, and then we're going to have to go to lunch. Not, not such a question, it's a Jessica, mm. but it sort of relates to the uh, to, to the, the, the Morris thing, because that picture of the side that came from Old Neil Richard Chagorin book also covers quite a lot of the people in the Archers who went to, uh, who, who were in the, sec in the First World War, uh, including apparently there was an Archers, uh, there was an Ambridge Old Pals type side. 
So I'll talk to you about that later, which I thought you might have to know. Brilliant. <laughs> we can collaborate. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Olivia? I was just going to ask if you thought that Jolene might be any good, given her experience calling at line dance. Oh. Yes, I think, I think she would. <laughs> yes, I think she'd be an excellent caller, and I think she'd be a very good dancer, actually. Um, but I think most people would see her as possibly one of the musicians. But certainly, yeah, certainly would be involved. Yeah. Okay, one question at the back. <laughs> Given the problem that they've had actually getting a viable cricket side together, <laughs> <laughs> on these Morris sites every week of the year, will it interfere with nets? And <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I do think that it would. Um, there were a lot of suggestions that actually the, the cricket side, the bell ringers, and the Morris side would be much one and the same. Um, but yes, I think the. There's always different concerns for people's time, um, but people do make time for things that they enjoy doing. And certainly, from my experience, Morris dancing is huge fun. <laughs> right, thank you very much. Um, so during lunch, we'll have the film on a roll here. We've obviously got the Morris dancing now. We're going to kind of come back for 1.30, so it's going to be really quick. And just one last thing to say. Hello, Mum! Hello! <laughs> I'll, I'll see you after lunch. Thank you. <laughs>